Biafra, Britain's Shame, Chapter 3, America in Search of a Policy The war between Nigeria and Biafra is an African problem. Why? Because London and Washington say so. They say so despite the fact that British and Soviet military support for Nigeria has internationalized the conflict from the start, despite the fact that the diplomatic and financial backing which Lagos has received from the British, America and Soviet government has weighted the scales against Biafra. London and Washington have continued to look to the Organization of African Unity to bring about peace despite the fact that the OAU has proved itself clearly incapable of handling the problem. They have ignored the fact that Anglo-American interference in the Nigerian dispute before Biafra broke away from the Federation helped to intensify the conflict. The most blatant and significant pre-war intervention occurred at the end of July 1966 after the second coup when the US ambassador to Nigeria, Mr. Albert G. Matthews, and the British High Commissioner, Sir Francis Cumming Bruce, persuaded Lieutenant Colonel Yakubu Guwon at the last minute to strike out of his speech the actual words announcing the dissolution of the Federation. Had the various parts of Nigeria been allowed to drift apart, a natural development after the political nightmare of the previous two years, a loser association, might have been formed, which would probably have prevented any large-scale military conflicts. Mr. Albert G. Matthews, the American ambassador, intervened again after the Eburo meeting, which would have given the regions a certain amount of autonomy by assuring Guwon of American support in his refusal to implement the essential conditions of the agreement. The Eastern region, on the other hand, was told in no uncertain terms that the United States would not stand behind it if it refused to cooperate with the policies which came out of Lagos and which were in direct contradiction with what had been agreed at Aburi. The British representative in Enugu at that time, Mr. James Parker, and his American counterpart, Mr. R. Barnard, the U.S. Consul, both reported to the respective government that Lieutenant Colonel Ojuku enjoyed the fullest support of the population of eastern Nigeria, but their warnings of the seriousness of the situation were disregarded. Sir David Hunt, who became British High Commissioner in Lagos in February 1967, is said to have sent Parker's report on to London with comments which suggested that he had become influenced by the emotions of his friends in Enugu. Similarly, in the case of the American consul, the difference between him and his superior in Lagos, Mr. Marches, was regarded in the State Department as a personality conflict. In preventing the dissolution of the Federation and in giving the policies of Lagos full support while opposing those in Enugu, the United States and Britain actively interfered in Nigerian affairs. This was stated firmly by Senator Eugene McCarthy when he argued that the claim that diplomatic recognition of Biafra would constitute intervention into purely African affairs was irrelevant. Non-recognition is also intervention. There are faults of omission as well as of commission. The United States has already intervened repeatedly in the area, first by propping up General Gowon when he assumed power, later by backing him when Nigeria abrogated the Aburi Agreement, and also by exerting pressure on a number of African nations not to recognize Biafra. A similar account of U.S. interference in Nigeria during 1966-67 to was given in a Republican Party publication. The official American account maintains a discreet silence concerning the second coup and events in Lagos during July 1966. Mr. Joseph Palmer, Assistant Secretary for African Affairs until May 1967, has suggested that the cause of the July coup was revenge because the new government, led by General Ironzi and Igbo, was not strong enough to punish the leaders of the original coup, despite strong demands to that effect from the North. As this misconception has crept into the official Nigerian mythology, it is worth pointing out, as the Biafrans have done, that the Supreme Military Council charged Guwon, 
who was then Army Chief of Staff, to investigate the circumstances of the first coup. Although he was repeatedly asked to submit his report, he has failed to do so. After the second coup, in the period before secession, according to Mr. Palmer, the US government urged both sides to negotiate their differences. When negotiations broke down, we cancelled against secession through our consul in Enugu, and Ambassador Matis flew to that city to try to dissuade Colonel Ojuku from this course. Mr. Albert G. Matthews in Lagos was more specific about the American commitment to the Nigerian cause. A few days after the outbreak of the war, in early July 1967, he sent a letter to the Nigerian-American Chamber of Commerce in Lagos, in which he stated, The facts are simple. My government recognizes the federal military government as the government of Nigeria. We have repeatedly made known our complete support of the political integrity of Nigeria. Many times we have expressed our hopes that Nigeria would continue to remain a united country. This is not only an official view, but one that is also felt by American businessmen engaged in the rapidly growing trade between our two countries. Despite the uncertainties of the past 18 months, there have been notable expressions of continued confidence in Nigeria's future by investors from the United States. The expansion of your own organization and the formation of counterparts like it is in the United States indicates the continuing importance of our mutual economic activities. Following the military coup of January 1966, and through all subsequent difficulties, the United States has consistently expressed its hopes that Nigerians will resolve their differences and maintain the cohesion of the country. Both alone and together with all the governments, the United States has urged Nigerian leaders to seek a solution that would ensure a stable future. Repeatedly, we have stated that Nigeria, as an independent country, should solve its own problems. We regard these as internal matters for the Nigerian people themselves. As a consequence of this policy, we have not, during the current crisis, supplied arms anywhere in Nigeria. It is our deepest desire that the present hostilities may be brought to a speedy end and that Nigeria will resume uninterruptedly her dynamic development. The decision by the State Department not to supply arms to Nigeria, which was announced four days after the outbreak of fighting, was not so much motivated as has been suggested by the desire to avoid any risks of deepening the conflict, as by the role which had broken out just prior to this about the American loan of three C-130 transport planes to General Mobutu in the Congo. The decision had certainly nothing to do with the idea that the matter was an internal Nigerian problem. In fact, U.S. Secretary of State Mr. Dean Rocks, explaining the decision on arms, stated that Nigeria was the primary responsibility of Great Britain. It has been suggested that this actually meant that Washington and London had agreed that the latter would supply the necessary arms. The architect of this policy was Mr. Joseph Palmer, who had been America's first ambassador to Nigeria, and who was personally as much committed to the idea of Nigeria being the showcase of Western democracy in Africa as the British architect of that ill-founded federation. There has been the closest consultation at all times between America and British officials on the Nigerian question. In July 1968, for instance, Mr. Palmer announced that an airlift could not carry in enough food to cope with the reported starvation in Biafra, and he said that the State Department had urged Biafra to accept a land corridor. The same line was being plugged in London. American officials then said that the United States had been trying to convince Biafra that its secession had been defeated and that it should compromise with the federal government to avoid starvation. Through informal contacts, the United States had tried to make the Biafrans see the solution in realistic terms. Whitehall said the same. But for some Americans, this attitude was not good enough. Senator Eugene McCarthy called on President Johnson in July 1968 
to ask the United Nations for a mandatory airlift of food to Biafra and to persuade Britain to stop arms shipment. He said that the U.S. should be prepared to back a division of Nigeria according to self-determination and he accused the Johnson administration of passivity and inaction. His rival for the Democratic nomination, Vice President Herbert Humphrey, called for the Red Cross to take prompt and risk-taking initiatives. The matter of Biafran starvation had become a subject of internal American politics. On September 9, 1968, presidential candidate Mr. Richard M. Nixon issued the following statement. The terrible tragedy of the people of Biafra has now assumed catastrophic dimensions. Starvation is daily claiming the lives of an estimated 6,000 Igbo tribesmen, most of them children. If adequate food is not delivered to the people in the immediate future, hundreds of thousands of human beings will die of hunger. Until now, efforts to relieve the Biafran people have been thwarted by the desire of the central government of Nigeria to pursue total and unconditional victory and by the fear of the Igbo people that surrender means wholesale atrocities and genocide. But genocide is what is taking place right now and starvation is the Grim Reaper. This is not the time to stand on ceremony or to go through channels or to observe the diplomatic niceties. The destruction of an entire people is an immoral objective, even in the most moral of wars. It can never be justified, it can never be condoned. Voluntary organizations such as the Red Cross, the World Council of Churches and Characters have rushed thousands of tons of high-protein rich nourishment and baby foods to the vicinity of the stricken region. Much of the food remains nearby while these children starve to death. The time has long passed for the ringing of hands about what is going on. While America is not the world's policeman, let us at least act as the world's conscience in this matter of life and death for millions. The President of the United States is a man charged with responsibilities and consigned all over the world, but I urge President Johnson to give to this crisis all the time and attention and imagination and energy he can muster. Every friend of humanity should be asked to step forward to call an end to this slaughter of innocents in West Africa. America is not without enormous material wealth and power and ability. There is no better cause in which we might invest that power than in staying alive the lives of innocent men and women and children who otherwise are doomed. There is no doubt that presidential candidate Richard Nixon was sincere when he spoke of genocide and the Nigerian government's desire to pursue total and unconditional victory. His election in November seemed to herald a new American policy towards Nigeria. This was probably one of the reasons for the creation at the suggestion of the White House of an emergency tax force on Biafra under Secretary of State Mr. Nicholas de B. Katzenbach at the end of November 1968. There was said to be a growing belief in high government circles that officials of the State Department as well as in the embassy in Lagos were emotionally committed to a quick kill policy as the only true solution to Biafran starvation. Mr. Joseph Palmer in Washington and Mr. Matthews in Lagos had seen little purpose in deliberately offending the Nigerian government in order to save starving civilians in Biafra. Nevertheless, reports compiled by the U.S. Agency for International Development were said to have created a fresh concern at the danger of starvation. The new move was therefore seen both as an effort to give the Biafran crisis a high priority in government policy making and to force a sweeping review of U.S. policies. A key source in Washington was quoted as saying, The time is fast approaching when the United States can no longer stand by and hope for a purely African solution to this problem. But in a statement in December, Mr. Katzenberg said that a solution to the conflict must be preeminently Nigerian and African. In the same breath, 
He said that the British, who have traditionally trained and supplied Nigeria with arms, have continued to do so. I do not really see how they could have made any other choice. Their position is clearly different from others who have been interlopers or journeys come lately in the Nigerian arms picture. If they had stopped their sales, they would, in fact, be helping to support the dismemberment of a fellow Commonwealth country with which they have had a special relationship since its independence. This hurry argument with which the British have tried to justify their policy does not even happen to be based on facts. Commenting on this claim in April 1968, Ojuku said that between 1964 and 1966, the only supply of military equipment that came to the then Nigeria from Britain were 12 ferret cars and two Saladins with a further order of four pending delivery right up to 1966. Ojuku who had been quartermaster general of the Nigerian army knew that during that period Nigeria stopped the purchase of rifles and machine guns from Britain when Nigeria signed a contract with a German firm of Fritz Werner in 1964 for the construction of the munition factory in Kaduna, northern Nigeria. He stated that Nigeria bought their recoilless light machine guns from Germany, 105mm, howitzers from Italy, 81mm, mortars from Israel, boots and equipment from Germany. A detailed study of this question by Mr. George Knapp shows that during 1964 and 1965, and right up to the end of Iran's military government, Britain had been replaced as a supplier of Nigerian military needs in every category except Amor cars. His case has not so far been answered by the British, and there is hardly any doubt that American officials were also aware of the true state of affairs. If they were not, then there was something seriously wrong with the American intelligence services. But Mr. Katzenberg was right in saying, the humanitarian aspect of the problem are hopelessly tied to its political aspects. The wonder is that the Americans, including Mr. Nixon himself, persist in tying their own hands by insisting that the two sides of the question must be kept apart. When he appointed Professor Clarence Clyde Ferguson, at the end of February 1969, as America's coordinator for relief to victims of the Nigerian War, President Nixon said that it should be within the conscience of man to give effect to humanitarianism without involving himself in the politics of the dispute. When Professor Ferguson reported to the Congregational Subcommittee on African Affairs on his return from Nigeria and Biafra, he was asked whether it was the position of the U.S. government that he could not apply himself to political problems. He replied that he had been told to stay away from political questions not directly relevant to the relief efforts. Thus, I can't deal with the ceasefire problem, though it is relevant to relief because it has been turned into a political problem because of its position in the negotiations. Asked whether he would have attempted to solve the conflict if he had been handed a political mandate, he said, I would have recommended that an effort be made. One of the senators on the subcommittee, perhaps incredulous about this state of affairs, asked whether any other personnel of the US government were trying to resolve the political and military sides of the conflict. Professor Ferguson said, No, not to my own knowledge. Why isn't the United States helping negotiate? The senator exclaimed, With a man of your talents, we might have used them a little better. In expecting Professor Ferguson to arrange for aid on these terms, Mr. Nixon may have been hoping for the impossible. To get sufficient food into Biafra to prevent what might be the biggest disaster in modern times may be impossible while fighting continues. But to call for a ceasefire is outside the competence of the U.S. Relief Coordinator. Food is, of course, a major weapon in this war. As Chief Enaharo, Nigeria's Commissioner for Labor and Information said, There are various ways of fighting a war. 
you might starve your enemy in submission or you might kill them on the battlefield. In December 1968, Washington announced that it was making available to a consortium of church relief groups four giant C-97 Stratofrighter cargo planes and another four to the International Red Cross. These, it was hoped, would double the amount of food which could be airlifted into Biafra, and the reaction in Nigeria was accordingly hostile. A statement in Lagos said that the federal government took a grave view of the decision, which if carried out, would directly and indirectly increase the arms carrying capacity of the rebels. It claimed that Caritax, the Roman Catholic Relief Organization, had admitted that they give space to the rebels in their planes. The US move would enable characters and other rebel supporters to donate their present plane entirely to the rebels for the traffic in arms. It would also encourage resistance and prolong the war as the Biafrans would think that the Americans were prepared to intervene in their favor to balkanize Nigeria. General Guon summoned the American ambassador in Lagos to ask for clarification and Mr. Matthews issued a statement in which he said that the aircrafts had been made available with a clear understanding that their use would be for strictly humanitarian purposes and for the use solely for the relief of non-combatants in transporting food and non-military supplies. He also repeated the well-worn phrases about the U.S. government's exclusive recognition of the federal military government in Nigeria adding that the U.S. continues to believe that only a negotiated settlement in the context of a single Nigeria with realistic guarantees for the safety and protection of all Nigerians will bring an end to the tragedy which has befallen Nigeria, a political statement, if ever there was one. Mr. Albert G. Matthews does not himself believe in a negotiated settlement. A couple of weeks before this official statement was issued, Ohio Republican Congressman Donald Lukens and an American newspaper man, Mr. Fulton Lewis, we are told by Mr. Matthews in his office in Lagos that a quick kill of Biafra would be the most humane solution to the present war. The point, of course, is that a quick kill is impossible. Lagos has tried its best to bring it about and has failed. But if such a policy were to succeed, it would cost millions of Biafran lives. Mr. Matthews' hope for a quick military solution are, of course, in direct contradiction to Mr. Nixon's declared abhorrence for the genocidal effects of Nigeria's desire for total and unconditional victory. The scandal is that Mr. Matthews, despite his well-known views, was allowed to continue as American ambassador in Lagos for so long. Congressman Lucan's visit to Lagos took place in the dying days of the Johnson administration. But Mr. Nixon had been elected and was preparing to assume office, and in the period immediately after his inauguration, it seemed that the Biafran question had a long last to receive the priority rating it needed. Within days of being sworn in, the new president called for a comprehensive review of the U.S. aid to victims of the Nigerian war requesting recommendations for additional United States action. The first official assignment of Mr. William Rogers, the new Secretary of State, was to inform the Foreign Minister of Equatorial Guinea of Americans' concern about the ban his government had imposed on Red Cross flights from Fernando Po into Biafra. On February 1, 1969, Mr. Rogers summoned Nigeria's ambassador in the U.S., Mr. Iyala, to discuss developments in the conflict. A week later, on February 8, Senator McGee, chairman of the Senate Subcommittee on Africa, called for an American mediation effort in Nigeria on the same lines as the Jerusalem mission to the Middle East. On the previous day, his congregational counterpart, Representative Charles Dix, left Washington to head the first official U.S. fact-finding mission to both sides of the war. But there, the steam suddenly went out of the American search for a new policy, and by March, things seemed back where they were under the Johnson administration. 
The process can best be illustrated by the strange transformation of Congressman Charles Diggs. He left Washington with good cheer and thoughts of peace. In Lagos, he said during a press conference that the U.S. should take an initiative in bringing about an arms embargo which might then be enforced by African states. Although an arms embargo was refused by the Nigerian authorities, who claimed that it would not affect Biafran supplies obtained on the black market, while it would hamper Nigeria's military operations. Their response to Mr. Dick's remarks were on the whole remarkably restrained. He then went off to Biafra, and having conferred with the leaders of both sides, he dashed back to Washington where Mr. Nixon was about to set off on a European tour. Whether he managed to report to the president before his departure is not quite clear, but Mr. Dix left no doubt about the opinions he had formed on his West African trip. In a special interview broadcast over the Voice of America, he said that the time was right for an American peace initiative. If the United States has a role to play, now is the time to play it. His conversations with Biafran and Nigerian leaders had convinced him that both sides wanted peace. I am optimistic that all consigned want to see an early negotiated settlement. He said that both sides were convinced that America was in a good position to initiate peace talks, pointing out that Washington had stayed neutral in refusing to supply arms. He said that the American image was not tarnished. Britain, France and the Soviet Union, by contrast, we are too closely involved on one side or the other to be trusted by both parties. He thought that the United States should make a direct approach. To go through other international channels would be too time-consuming. Nigeria and Biafra appeared ready for a settlement now, but the opportunity might not last. That was at the end of February. When Mr. Digg's official report was published a few weeks later, his opinions had miraculously changed. He now thought it was improbable that an interested third nation such as the United States would be able to act as a catalyst to bring about successful peace talks which led to a lasting settlement. The United States is not likely to have any particular power of suasion over the federal government, which it continues to recognize. He found that a negotiated settlement is most likely to result from the mediation efforts of the OAU Consultative Committee rather than those of the United Nations or another interested party. The transformation of Mr. Diggs was clearly a State Department's triumph. What does it matter that his report, apart from its one-sided interpretation of events, was studded with factual mistakes? It mattered nothing as long as it's found the U.S. correct in recognizing the federal military government of Nigeria as the only legal government of that country. As long as it discovered no justification for Biafra's continued refusal to permit daylight operation by the International Committee of the Red Cross and Joint Church Aid Mercy Missions, as long as it proclaimed that if military and political considerations are the basis for the rejection of daylight flights and land corridors, then the Biafrans must take responsibility for the consequences. The Nigerians were allowed to have political and military considerations. This is why they refused to agree to a ceasefire, which would have solved the relief problem. The Biafrans were not. This view was not so easily imposed on Professor Ferguson through Mr. Diggs, for one did his best. At the congressional hearing in April, he suggested that Ferguson had stated that the Biafrans had unreasonably blocked food into Biafran territory. I did not say they had unreasonably blocked food, Ferguson retorted. I was told that their first requirement was military and national security and all relief had to be matched against this. I was told time and time again by Biafran officials that they were not interested in being fattened for the slaughter. Later on, Mr. Dix remarked that he had seen, while in Biafra, a French plane land in Uli with Red Cross markings, which was carrying hardware. 
So you can see the military problem which relief planes pose for the Nigerians. It is interesting that in his published report, he had merely spoken of conversations with witnesses who had observed at first hand on large delivery by air of military supplies from a French source. America's policy on Nigeria had been fraudulent, almost as fraudulent as that of Britain. Having intervened in Nigeria to prevent the development of a loser relationship between the different parts of the country, the U.S. government shares the responsibility for having created the political conditions which caused the war. Despite this intervention, Washington has pretended that the conflict is Nigeria's domestic affair and an African matter in which non-Africans should not intervene. While preaching non-involvement in the politics of the dispute, the American government has all along been deeply committed to backing the Lagos regime and its declared war aim, the re-establishment of Nigeria unity. American spokesmen have applied double standards in judging Nigeria and Biafran attitudes to such questions as relief, praising Lagos for offering measures which had been offered in the first place only because they were known to be unacceptable to the Biafrans and condemning Biafra for turning down proposals which might have started her on the road to political capitulation and military defeat. This policy has been applied without consideration even for the wishes of the people on the Nigerian side. The only certainty is that a few departments fools of officials and policy makers in Washington, London and Moscow have decided that unity is best for Nigeria. The Nigerian military leaders had forced to be persuaded to accept this view, though there is little doubt now that they have turned into one Nigerian man since they have been propped up in office for the sake of this concept. It has also been welcomed by those Nigerians who have benefited by the Biafran's misfortunes and departure, and the Lagos Junta and its British, American and Russian allies can count on support from the Arabs and other Muslim parts of the world.